Thank you. On some of this, we'll say amen. <laughs> Let it just happen. Uh, I, I want to invite um, the second, uh, um, you know, panel speaker. And, you know, you saved some question later on on the pharmacogenomics, so it's okay. It's, it's not bad the time. So I want to invite you off Benjamini, uh, which is um, the Nathan and Lily Silvi Professor at, of Applied Statistics at Tel Aviv University. Uh, I must say he's one of the, the most cited Tel Aviv University professors, um, given, given his um, uh, papers. Um, he has been working in many fields of life sciences, as everybody in here knows, as well as in methodological uh, statistics, where he is known for the um, false discovery uh, rate, FD, FDR, which that's the paper that he's so um, cited for, is widely used in genomics and the other high um, throughput methodologies. So, thank you. <laughs> we have to get okay actually I uh, the slides will serve me only for two pictures so I, I'll have them but uh, oh where's the where's that View, 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 view. <laughs> As you can see, I'm working on Apple. <laughs> okay. And being now on the West Coast, uh, somebody who uses uh, this kind of machine is an outlier. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'll speak about uh, the ideas and the implementation in some sense. And the first, uh, the first experience uh, of translation medicine in the broader sense was an unfortunate uh, start, in fact. How many of you are aware of the Potty and Nevins uh, issue about personal medicine? Okay, very few, I see. Um, so um, they started, there's a paper that appeared in Nature Medicine in... Uh, 2006, uh, they were using really uh, translational uh, work. They took databases, uh, cell lines, uh, having gene expression, different chemotherapies uh, were used on the, um, on the cell lines, and uh, they were termed as responding or non-responding. Then the idea is you take, the, you take them and then you predict the response, then comes a patient, in the way we heard before, you check the gene expression of the patient tumor and you classify him and give the appropriate uh, chemotherapy. And the paper received enthusiastic response because it really was the first time that not a single mutation or something like that was used, like the cross mutation we, we heard uh, before, but the whole signature of gene expression was used to decide what chemotherapy was indicated as uh, beneficial to decide what uh, chemotherapy to use. So here we have translational, personalized medicine converging and so on and so forth. Well, two uh, the people at the Anderson uh, Center were as enthusiastic, research center, the cancer research center, were as enthusiastic as everyone else and immediately wanted to try to use it. So they went to their statisticians, uh, Baggerly and uh, Kumbers, and asked them to uh, build a similar system so that they can use, uh, the same, use the same classifier. And the two tried to replicate the analysis. There was no documentation. Well, they didn't despair, and they tried to do detective work. I mean, reverse engineering to understand what the method was. And they did the reverse engineering or detective work, and it led to some conclusions that there were mislabeled genes, and there were mislabeled response labels, that is, they identified they were in the original uh, database, they were 
I think 90 respondents and 30 non-respondents. Somehow in the published paper, it was the other way around. There were about 19, 29 non-respondents and the other way around. And slowly tried to figure out what goes on. And uh, in 2007, sent a letter to um, Nature uh, Medicine. And the letter appeared together with the response of the authors. And the authors said that these are really accounting mistakes, yes. Uh, in fact, the genes there, uh, probably things shifted one row so the names were not quite appropriate and uh, things like that. But it didn't change the, the nature of the results. That was the point. So, Bagley, as I, I, from, personal, uh, from his personal recollection, he said, well, okay, I made the right part. And, uh, but then papers continued. Okay? And there were four more studies that appeared in influential papers, all using the same ideas, the same model exactly, uh, using more and more chemotherapies. And clinical trials were started, if I'm not mistaken, three clinical trials. And Duke set up a company, Duke University, from which they are, set up a company, startup company, to utilize commercially these ideas. Uh, actually, Beggarly, Beggarly became occupied with the matter. He continued to find problems in the studies. He couldn't publish now in the responses and letters. He gave talks about that until somebody, he once giving a talk at the statistics department, suggested to him, you know what, write a paper about this problem. And in fact, the paper was submitted to the Annals of Applied Probability and within two weeks appeared on the electronic page. Those of you working in statistics know what it means. I mean, it's unheard of. Now, the fact, the unfortunate fact is, uh, let, let me just summarize the problem that he found because it is very much related. There are duplicate resources but they, from different databases, but they had the same cell lines. So actually, there weren't 122 cell lines, there were only 84. Mislabeling in one study was up to three-eighths of the labels. Outliers were removed with no notifications. Treatment was confounded with run data. That is, the microarrays were first run of the cases, then of the controls. Now, those of you who know that there is variability between different, uh, different uh, tables know that uh, this is a major reason for uh, confounding. Moreover, a figure from one publication on a new cell line was identical to a figure from a different publication on a different cell line. That much of a problem. In their work, Beggarly and, and Coombs, in their statistical paper, said simple problems are common, but common mistakes are simple. But still, poor documentation can shift from inconvenience to endangering patients. And this remained so until it was discovered that actually uh, Potty padded his resume. That is, he claimed that he has received a prize in Australia, which he didn't actually receive. And that became a real issue. And then there were committees, and then Nature Medicine asked for them to write again the paper. And Duke, which has previously set up a committee to check the problems but never called these two statisticians and decided that everything is OK, stopped the clinical trials, the problems with uh, lawsuits, and so on and so forth. But only after personal fraud was discovered was this whole set of issues covered. And what I, I mean, the message from this is really that uh, you know, Professor Zellens' fundamental contribution to the way that clinical trials are designed and conducted really should continue to show the way even at this translational age. Now, the means can be modern even though the goal will remain the same. And I'd like to make a few statements about replicable, replicable analysis, computation, and communication of results. The problems that I mentioned before, like shifting of columns, switching of labels, and so on, very common in Excel, working in Excel files, for example. If the problem is that simple problems are hidden. It's not easy to find them, not yourself. And there were a few efforts to encounter this problem in modern computing environment. So there is this weave 
sweep which combines LaTeX and MATLAB and R. The idea is when you run the LaTeX, it redoes the computation that led to a figure. So the, the data and computation become part of the figure, and that's very uh, useful. There is the Wave Lab. I mean, the, a group of people working in wavelets analysis, uh, in the, originally in the MATLAB environment, and they have 15 years of commitment to reproducible code development and reporting. So a book comes out, and all of the figures in the book are, uh, are available also online in the way they were generated. The most recent initiative along this direction is by uh, David Donohoe and his student Matan Gavish, which is Verifiable Computational Research, VCR. The idea, the underlying idea is that you never do computations for your own sake when you're dealing in this matters. But computations mean publications. And if that's the case, as you compete, as you compute from data, the entire history of your computation is kept online. And you can always return to you, you threw out outliers and you changed something and you transformed and it's all kept on in history. And um, this is done in the R environment, so accessible to many uh, statisticians. Now, every result in a paper is associated with a, how do they call it, a VRI, Verifiable Research Identification. So you can run the LaTeX file, have all of the figures, have all of the statements about the p-value and the effect size and so on, and each one of them will have an identifier which is linked to the program, the computation that generated it. So essentially, the idea is, uh, furthermore, that the, the VRI details will be stored in public uh, repository. And the point they are making is that it is essential for stranger to be able to use your results. And strangers are your uh, new PhD students, your postdocs, your colleagues, the referees, other people in the other laboratories, or even you yourself when you come three years later and you have no idea about what you have done. And in fact, I have to admit, I felt, we felt, uh, uh, we submitted the paper to PNAS and in one of the figures, one of the colors was switched and we were able to, to find it in time and send, not completely time, we had to say a correction. I mean, things happen and this kind of Methods allow you to avoid them. Okay. But this is assuring replicability in computation, analysis, documentation. One minute. Okay. The question is, um, the question is how do we assure replicability in the other parts? So we have predictive markers, and this is the idea that was presented before, predicting who will benefit from treatment. And this may include all of the... Uh, components that Mia mentioned, socioeconomic physiology, genetics, and so on and so forth. Okay? And the question is how to do it. And there are two approaches to do it right now. The one thing is more of the machine learning idea. The machine learning idea, you take everything in, you develop a complicated model, signature, you can call it, signature and sociology and so on. You take it away, you try to verify it, you try to use uh, um, um, cross-validation, permutation, test, and so on, all within the one that you have. Well, if you have this formula, can you take it to new patients and be sure that it will work there? There is no way it's going to work there. And designing a study that takes this much is almost impossible. So, uh, and this is uh, one example that I wanted. This is why I needed the presentation. Uh, Barrett Al analyzed a set of 7,000 probes looking for promising results. They took 1,000 uh, different gene sets, ran SVM models of 5 to 100, looked at the most frequent gene, and here is the most frequent gene between the cancer samples and the other samples. Complicated method, the outcome is in terms of identifying, it's the most promising gene. Uh, on the other hand, okay, this is from uh, Yulia's Gavrilov thesis. What she took is she took 120 replication, 
bootstrap replication, fit the logistic regression using all those all the same genes, but introduced a penalty, FDR-based penalty on the selection model. Okay, and then she looked at the frequency of the replication. This is what came. These are the six most promising ones. I mean, look at the distinction in all of the models. Only one gene was needed. Only one gene was needed. And in fact, look at the separation in each one of these between one and the other. The point is that this leads to subsets and not to a prediction function. And in fact, what I hope to, what I hope to say in the last 30 uh, seconds is that I am not in favor of uh, completely personalized medicine which is subset analysis carried to its extreme. You do subset analysis and you go all the way to a single patient, but you have to go a little bit further out. You have to do semi-personalized medicine in which the definition of a group that gets a treatment is not completely personal, but has size to this subset. So this can be analyzed, this can be replicated, the Science underneath it can uh, be understood, and future analysis, which will not be done in the same places, with the same population, with the same technology, which has already changed three times during the last uh, century, all of this will be done different. But if they are not defined sort of algorithmically, but has sense to them, they will be very uh, useful and very promising. Thank you.